Uh, my focus was on what makes people uh, stay in the workplace longer, um, kind of looking at how mm -hmm. engagement and identification can be key in regard to that. And I studied, uh, at first I was going to study millennials, but of course they kind of age out. So I focused on emerging adulthood theory, which is 18 to 29 year old. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by Dr. Mark Stone, who is over in Phoenix, Arizona. Now Mark is actually a professional EOS implementer, but he's also got a strong history in organizational development and leadership, which he'll tell you more about. So welcome to the show, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me. Good to be here. Absolute pleasure. Hey, we've just been having a quick chat before we came on the podcast, as we always do, hearing a bit about your your life story. Would you mind sharing a wee bit of you know where you came from and how a Brit ended up in the US? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so I, I was uh, born in Sheffield, northern northern England. Um, so like a whole bunch of us, I the not quite make it soccer players, uh, move across to the northeast of America to, to go kind of coach and still kind of live out the uh, trying to still be a player, but having to move into coaching. So. I moved to Philadelphia uh, in 2006 and set up a sports coaching business there. And then several years later, moved out here to the to the sun right the other side of the country. So did a couple of hops. Nice. <laughs> and so you, that's what took you there in the beginning. But obviously, life has changed a wee bit since then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I work as a professional EOS implementer. So I get to live in, in that special world of, of helping business leadership teams go and kind of chase down their, their dreams and go on their journeys together. So, you know, I've been fortunate through my work career in the US to, to visit about, I think, 35, 35 states. So, yeah, there's been a whole bunch come on from kind of, you know, trudging around the fields of Philadelphia coaching soccer. Fair enough. So, yeah, I mean, obviously we share that same passion, right? That whole, um, I fell in love with the EOS because of the fact that it works on both the business and the lifestyle of business owners, which I think is really important. But what, what got you into EOS? Like where did, cause you've, from what we talked about, you know, you started off in sports instruction, um, but then moved into some sort of tech companies, e-commerce. What, what, how did you come across EOS and what, why did you decide to pursue that? Um, so it was handed to me uh, by a CEO who'd um, just read it and put a whole bunch of it into practice in his in his firm. So he just set his 10 year target and he was all excited in terms of that realm. And for me, when I read it, I'm, I'm quite quantitative. So it kind of hit all the right spots for me. And I felt as a business owner, I'd done several of the things probably in a much less eloquent way. So it kind of almost kind of had that kind of magic effect of feeling like, hey, these are the things I've been saying and thinking and doing for several years. and somebody managed to kind of put it into a you know well thought out process so yeah that was kind of yeah. it but from that point it kind of reframed my my thinking a little bit and that was the way i think you know things should ideally be done it's interesting because I had the same experience. I mean, I've been actually coaching for a number of years as I was running businesses and I have done my MBA program. And so for me, it actually encompassed all of that learning that was completely impractical with all the practical stuff I've been doing in terms of running businesses and, and through the coaching that I did. It's like, wow, this is like somebody's actually put this all together in a really simple, pragmatic format um, that I think gives entrepreneurs a chance to not lose their entrepreneurial spirit, but just have a little bit of structure around it to help them kind of go forward. So you obviously fell in love with the same thing. Yeah, yeah, just the right amount of structure. I think that's the, I think that's yes. the thing that's right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I always say we don't we don't want to restrict you know entrepreneurs because it's them they they really do change the world and, and being an entrepreneur myself you know I know that I tend to get distracted by bright shiny lights but if we can just <laughs> give a little bit of structure and I say like we, we want them to still zigzag but just a little bit um a bit shorter zigzags rather than kind of going off on complete <laughs> tangents. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about you know you've, you've got a, a doctorate. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I studied here at, at Grand Canyon University. It was a it was a five year journey. So. Um, it kind of becomes a, a battle of attrition at a certain at a certain point, working through the classes and then developing a paper. And kind of like all good kind of stories, mine had a twist in that I did my actual study through COVID. So when you're kind of studying leadership and its effect on on turnover, and then you know unemployment kind of goes through the roof, and everybody's concerned about the job, it it kind of made it an interesting an interesting study. So uh, my focus was on what makes people uh, stay in the workplace longer. Um, kind of looking at how mm -hmm. engagement and identification can be key in regard to that. And I studied, uh, at first I was going to study millennials, but of course they kind of age out. So I focused on emerging adulthood theory, which is 18 to 29 year olds. So obviously as new generations come through, they face some challenges and 
it's kind of a golden ticket if we can work out how to get those young folks on board, train them up, make them happy, you know, in regard to what they're doing and keep them for a, a long while. So yeah, it was a it was a fun time to complete the study. I can imagine. And in fact, it must be absolutely fascinating because I know that a lot of the business owners I work with struggle, you know, to actually retain staff and particularly in that younger um, age group. So what was the key learnings that you took from that study? So I studied authentic leadership, which is just that, you know, kind of authenticity and self-awareness have kind of become pretty big buzzwords this past, you know, certainly in 2022. But essentially where those yeah. younger staff are able to identify that there's a good, clear vision in place and they've got people around them who will who will be honest with them, who will encourage them, who will call them out when they're not when they're not kind of doing what they're supposed to. That makes people feel part of things and, and stick around longer. So um, the kind of key finding was that for leaders, they kind of have to be their self. They have to show an openness, a good moral perspective, be transparent about the decisions. And that's that's pretty inspiring. So it's not necessarily a secret source, but leaders just being themselves and looking to involve their younger people in, in some of their thinking sometimes. I can see how that dovetails perfectly with EOS then, right? Because we're all about actually having those open, honest conversations, fighting for the greater good and working together as a, as a leadership team as opposed to a distinct silo. So um, I can imagine that would have appealed, the EOS yeah. framework would have appealed in terms of that. Yeah. And then and then obviously the, the Jim Collins that we speak to, the right people, right, right seat where you can set people up in, in that regard, that can be you know, absolutely, absolutely key as as well to allow people to go perform. I seem to speak to a, a lot of leaders in this past six months who, you know, heavily focused on work-life balance, which of course we, you know, we do our, our very best is to, you know, help folks get as, you know, as kind of as strong as possible. Uh, but then also I hear a lot of leaders yep. kind of apologizing for the leader that they're not. And I try and encourage everybody to yep, be self-aware about the things that, you know, might be blind spots for us, but really be more about our strengths and focus on focus on those than the worrying about our weaknesses kind of after 23 24 we kind of who are we up we who are we going to be anyway for the rest of our lives so it makes sense to kind yeah. of make the most of that rather than worry about the stuff we're not excellent so i know that you graduated from eos boot camp um, earlier on this year and you've got quite a number of clients that you're working with what have been some of the the real key aha moments for you in some of those businesses because you know i know they're all very very different but there's often you know similar things that we see happening in those businesses yeah i think every business is unique and has its own uh, variables and goals and, and challenges but yeah i think the thoughts Several of those kind of challenges are on quite similar themes. I think it's pretty fantastic what we do that we get to partner with folks to work on some of those, some of those things. And the, you know, I think my key learning has been that the, the knowledge is nearly in the, nearly always in the room. It's up to us to help groups to kind of dissect it, pull it out, and then kind of jump on it. So I think that's, I think that's maybe the most fun part of what we get to get to do on a daily basis. I agree with you. I think that a lot of people think that, you know, we're business coaches or consultants who are there to kind of tell them what to do. But we all, I always joke that I'm just the, the dumb blonde with the marker at the front of the room. Um, because as you said, the knowledge is in the room. It's our job to just get that knowledge out, ask the hopefully intelligent questions and get them thinking about what is the right, the right answers. Yeah. Yeah. Without question. That's a fun thing to be a, to be a part of. And particularly as we help people develop those vision traction documents out to then to be able to see the kind of energy in the room when those things are, kind of crystallized and perhaps even clarified for the first time yeah. is is pretty key. I chatted with a, a business owner yesterday who kind of mentioned he has a whole bunch of that kind of mapped out, but he's not shared it with any of his people yet. And I'm like, that's really kind of the secret secret source. Go talk about it, go share it regularly and, you know, work out who really yeah. wants to be on, on board with you. Yeah. Actually, it's really interesting is when we do the um, the second day of EOS, so we're actually getting into that, you know, what's our big, what's our core values, what's our 10-year target, what is our core focus. Um, we, we know that this vision already exists, right? It already exists in the brains, usually of the founders and often the whole leadership team. And often the founders, you know, when they share it and they get the team's input, they realize that they've all, they've all been on the same page, but they haven't been able to clearly articulate it and, you know, have the same message that they can then share with the broader team. So I always love it when you have that light bulb moment like that's it we've nailed it that's what yeah that's what it's all about <laughs> and well then going back to my going back to my study a little bit that's kind of key because that gets yeah. people engaged and focused and and driven i think when when folks truly feel part of something where it's not as much of a mandate then it really gets kind of buy-in mm. and it's 
it's just more fun as well, right? You get to kind of really enjoy each kind of step in the in the journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you ever had a team where there hasn't been quite so much cohesiveness when you're doing that that longer term planning? Um, yeah, I think um, I did. Uh, I I've worked um, in some other realms where we do behavioral assessments. So I think when you see people come in with different viewpoints. Um, I think sometimes I found that people can ultimately believe and see the same thing, but describe it differently or come at, you know, kind of come at it from a different angle. So I think that's pretty, pretty common. I think something that's really kind of enjoyable on our part is, is kind of supporting people in developing a synthesized view. So I've had a, a few teams where they're um, not necessarily not cohesive, but have different kind of viewpoints and allowing them to kind of share those and get on the same page and work out which things to focus on has been pretty fun, but yeah, it's just, it's just interesting. We're all, we're all different in terms of our kind of natural levels of extroversion and our competitiveness, the mm. levels of patience we have. So it's interesting when you mesh all those in the room and a successful business needs different, different viewpoints and different characteristics and different drives. So yeah, it's fun to, to do yeah. that. I've done some work previously in working with folks where we identify some of those things. So again, it goes back to, trying to help people focus on what they are and what they're, what they're not. And no, that's okay. Like, you know, don't try and change to kind of suit the, suit the room, be yourself. Yeah. And that comes back to that right people in the right seats as too, doesn't it? Well, you actually want, you yeah. want a, a range of different people with different skills, but all on the same page in terms of the core values that they, they believe in what's, what's, you know, yeah. how we work around here. I think around, the yeah, but... to that same page can sometimes be quick and sometimes be a little longer and, and that's okay. That's okay too. Yeah. Perfect. Hey, one of the things that I always really loved about EOS, and it was one of the things that kind of sold me, was that in terms of the proven process, we don't jump into that vision, core value stuff in the first day. Our first day is very much about teaching practical tools they can take out and use. And and having worked for many, many years at the Ice House and other, other various incubators, we always did this big session of, woohoo, let's develop our vision and our mission and all these things. And, and we have a great day. And then we walk out of the, uh, uh, the, the workshop space, go out into the real world. And of course, nothing had changed, which means we're back to fighting fires. We're back to doing all the same stuff we always did and I always wondered you know how come the people didn't embrace this and just run with it and I think what I learned through EOS is that actually you've got to change fundamentally the way the business works first of all before you can introduce that stuff in, in an effective way which is what our first day does so um, yeah tell me a little bit about that the, yeah, the process for a, you and, and what you I love about it have, yeah I have a mentor who's uh, quite familiar with our process and we've discussed that several several times he kind of asked me hey how can we you know, how come you don't do the, the vision related stuff, the core values and the core focus on the, on the first day. But yeah, I think yep. obviously there's a, there's a lot of benefit to what we do in making sure that whoever's going to put their hand up and take responsibility has a, has a say when those, you know, bigger picture and longer term targets are, are set in place. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's really key to make sure you have the right people contributing into that, you know, early defining mm -hmm. period and ultimately taking responsibility for going and working on it kind of day one after, after they leave our session. Yeah. So you're talking about the, the fact that we, we deal with structure first. We look at the accountability chart and go, right, what's the right structure that we need to actually uh, deliver on the, the long-term vision? And then we sort of give them some tools to actually start putting in place. So when they come back on the second day, they can then start to look at that, that longer-term picture. Yeah. And it's so often that we... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, go on, go on. I said, and it's, I think it's so often the case that where that accountability chart isn't isn't quite set and there are right people right seat issues that there are so many issues that derive from derive from that so i think it's really a key you know it's obviously a key tool that we use to help people get to people to get set up but there's so many times i think when there is an issue in a business that that you know that people you know that people element is the thing to go fix and work on and you know really put a whole bunch of effort into getting to getting straight as quickly as possible Mm, yeah, completely agree. So I, I have a favorite tool in the US, but I'm not going to share that yet. What do you have a favorite tool that you sort of just feel really changes things sort of fundamentally for businesses? Well, I kind of want to hear what yours is first. Am I allowed to? <laughs> it's kind of like, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to it. I want to hear what yours is and I'm happy to share. <laughs> I, I think mine is our level 10 meetings and the issue solving, issue solving yeah. track. I'm uh, by nature a fast moving, proactive individual. So that kind of mechanism for getting issues out on the table, digging into the to the root causes to make sure we're having, you know, real purposeful, authentic conversations, and then having a way to go, you know, get to make decisions and set, you know, actionable to do's that we're accountable for. Right. I love that mechanism for bringing people together. And it's 
also dedicated strategic time. It allows those folks who are working on their work-life balance to know this is a daily issue that I really should go chat with somebody about today. And this is a issue to save for our strategic meeting. So I think it's that it's those level 10 meetings that really bring everything together and allow those leadership teams to, you know, get and stay on the same, the same page. So how about you? Uh, we're actually we're on the same page. It's also my favorite tool. And what I love about the IDS particularly is I think that as humans, we've got this natural tendency to want to jump in and kind of solve things immediately without spending the time to work out what's really behind the issue. And so I love the fact that IDS kind of forces you to spend a lot of time identifying what that real issue is and then discussing all the possible options, not just going, yep, I've got the solution. Let's fix that. Um, and before you actually get to the, you know, the practical, okay, what are the next steps? What are the to do? So yeah, I do believe that that uh, just even even, even just using IDS without a level 10 meeting can fundamentally change the way you approach business and life. Yeah, and I think going back to how people have different viewpoints, that that moment when we've discussed an issue where, you know, somebody calls out, are we, are we ready to make a decision here? I found that, you know, in observing those and working with my, my teams to get feedback that, you know, about half of the time, the issue is everything that's said does need to be said. And then the other half of the time, somebody's had a new thought or they've been kind of sat on something that they want to contribute and move towards. So I think it's kind of a feel that leadership teams, leadership teams develop to make sure that before they do make a decision, everybody's been heard, had some input and, you know, it's a good, yeah. full, high quality decision rather than just a, a tick box to move on to something else. Surface level. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's really interesting. I was working with a client a little while ago, and I mean, um, you know, we talk about the fact that, hey, you've got accountability. So if you can solve things in your own area, you know, go ahead and do that. But if you need the help of the team, bring it up to the leadership team. And this was a, a company that had, was having a few, a few cash flow issues, a few challenges in that sort of, you know, cash flow area. And they were a food manufacturer. So they had a head chef who was kind of in charge of the recipes and producing the meals. And they had all the, so he was there in, in terms of the operational side of things. We had all the usual sales and marketing, um, you know, the, the, the integrated, the visionary and the finance and ambient person. And of course, people would normally think, oh, well, cash flow has to be resolved by the finance team. But it was actually the chef in the end who came up with the, the solution because he was the one working in the space day in, day out. And once he understood what the issue really was, he could have put his mind to it and they discussed it. And, and you know, um, of course, the team owned the decision, but he was the one that actually brought something a bit new to the table that they couldn't see for looking in some respects. Yeah, I am. Um... I've taught at the business school nearby and I teach marketing and leadership, which are, which are my passions, but yeah. I often try and kind of project on the students. I'm like the classes you really need to be listening to are the ones in finance and accounting. If they're not your first love, because they're being able to see somebody else's viewpoint, I think is key to being a, a good leadership team member. So yeah, I think it goes back to those different viewpoints and trying to get a balanced level of input from each, each expert. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if we've got some people who are sitting here thinking, you know, well, what, what the heck is EOS? I mean, I would hope that they've, they've heard a little bit about it on the podcast, but I mean, how, how would you describe what EOS is and, and what it does for a business? Um, so to me, I go back to the, it's a business operating system to harness human energy. And then the other way I would always, you know, like to explain it is it's a, it's a set of, you know, simple tools that are rolled out in a, you know, very kind of careful manner to, to help groups achieve those, you know, three, three focus areas of hours of helping them with their vision, traction and health. So I think sometimes, uh, you know, what a business operating system, you know, is requires some explanation, but um, I tend to just lean on that. It's a, it's a whole bunch of simple tools that, that we use in a very careful order to, you know, to get you all on the same page and moving together with, with that accountability. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, I think it's true. I mean, I, often when I say, you know, I've got, I'm an EOS implementer, they go, oh, entrepreneurial operating system, is it a soft piece of software? It's like, well, no, <laughs> it's not a piece of software. There is some software that can certainly help you, but really it is, as I putting some structure around all those key areas in the business and making sure that, as you said, implementing simple, I call them pragmatic tools that you can put in place in a certain order that helps to bring everybody onto the same page and have that discipline and accountability. And, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think that's one of my yeah. favorite, you know, of our healthy rules. I, I always talk about the elephant in the room. It's one of my sort of specialties is like uncovering that elephant and, and, um, helping them resolve it. But I think that a lot of teams just have never had that opportunity to be really open, be really honest and have those frank discussions about things that are pretty major in the business. Yeah. I think it gives, I think we give, um, folks, a um, a forum and almost permission to go and, you know, almost an encouragement and maybe even a slight pressure to go to do, go dig in and, you know, be that open and honest. And 
you know, really yeah. share your feelings. And I think it puts the onus on, on folks. And I think that's a great thing in the long term because again, it gets that, it gets that engagement and gets people part of something. So yeah, I would, would entirely agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was working with a team that, um, you know, they, they started doing EOS and, and it's always a little bit difficult in the beginning. I always feel a little bit sorry for them because we kind of challenge everything that they know and we, we really put them on the spot in terms of changing some things. But after nine months, they'd actually hit their 12 month target. And the team that had come in in the beginning to the team that was actually there at nine months was slightly different because we'd gone through the accountability chart. There'd been some changes in that leadership team. And from not really knowing, you know, why they existed, what they were there for, what was really going on, even after nine nine months, you know, it was just it was such a fundamental change in that team and how they worked together. And they, you know, they had the fights, but they did it for the greater good, which meant that, um, you know, they were getting the right results. And it's just great to see them actually having those open, frank discussions. It makes my heart sing, seeing that kind of stuff happen. <laughs> yeah. And I think that even that word that you mentioned, that change word for, for a whole bunch of, yeah. bunch of folks in the world, that's exciting. And for the other half, that's something that kind of makes them kind of shudder a little bit. So <laughs> I think being yeah. able to support groups through those changes is, yeah, I think that's a really fun part of what we get of what we get to do. Mm. So, what's been the biggest kind of challenge that you've had yourself, either in your own businesses or, or in working with people through EOS? What do you think was the biggest thing that's been a hurdle? If I go back to my own my own challenges. Um, one of the first jobs I had was for a company that went bankrupt. Um, so, a couple of years later, when I decided to set my own business up, I did it uh, without particularly any any capital, uh, the bank manager that wouldn't lend us 600 pounds to go set up a business. I, I kind of routinely went in to give him a hard time and let him know, hey, we're still here, we're still functioning. But I think there was probably a method nice. in his madness. But in, in setting up, um, kind of see, kind of learning those lessons of seeing how a company over overspent and didn't have great systems in place, I built my uh, first two businesses with contractors. And I also kind of had the priority that we were going to pay people that we owed straight away. So as soon as somebody's wage was due, we were going to pay that. And that was a, a priority. So in trying to build, you know, yep. fast growing, aggressive businesses without a whole bunch of capital, that was probably the biggest, that was probably the biggest challenge. I'm interested because, you know, that definitely having contractors makes it a bit easier in the beginning. But how do you actually motivate, inspire and keep contractors on the same page? Because um, people will often say, oh, well, contractors, they don't actually work for you. You know, they've got every opportunity to kind of leave. Um, how did you keep them yeah, motivated, inspired on the same page? Well, I think that was a, a great learning opportunity for me because in my 20s where you you're naturally extra bold and ready to move on things. I really needed those contractors much more than they needed they needed me. So I think it meant that the folks ah. that we brought in, we really did have to become about that kind of exciting vision and be clear with people on how they could come in, you know, do well and be part of it. I think it made that the central yeah. focus out of kind of out of a desperation. So as you know, when you get those people that are excited about what you're doing on board, typically good things fall into into place. So um, in the two businesses yeah. I set up, um, one stayed almost entirely on a contractor model with the exception of some full-time staff. The other business, the one back in, in Britain, transitioned to have you know, full-time salaried, salaried staff. But I still think in, even in that entity, we were able to keep the same, same kind of commitment and, and focus. So it really does connect in with you know, one of the key pillars of EOS of getting the right people on, people on board to make life, life easy. Yeah, people who kind of share your why and share your core values. It's interesting. One of my clients is actually a, a VA virtual assistant service, and she's got 40 odd contractors around New Zealand, and they are all contractors, and yet they still run EOS. They still have their level 10 meetings, and the team, they're just another team. It doesn't matter what their status of employment is. They're still on the bus with them, you know, um, living and breathing the vision and, and all, all in it for the greater good. Yeah, and I think the since um, obviously the pandemic, the there's become a new pressure on organizations to to really go out and foster that you know that environment to be able to keep and retain and you know kind of you know maximize the talent that they've got and i think in i think in many ways that's a that's a good thing you know it's really put yeah. pressure on organizations to go and to go and be appealing to people so i think it's an opportunity and those that those that kind of do best of that are going to have the best talent and and win in the long term yeah but the reality is sometimes we have the wrong person, right? And we actually don't want to keep them because they're not doing like, great <laughs> yeah, things for the company. <laughs> so um, have you had, you know, what experiences have you had with that and how have you dealt with it or how have you seen others deal with it? Yeah, I've dealt with, with that several times. And I think it's the, 
in working with folks who are handling that because it is it is difficult again transition and change is always is always tricky but i think it's also it's also the best move for an individual many times if somebody's you know somebody's not capable of excelling in that role or they don't jive with the company's culture it it really does help that person to cut to the chase as quickly as as possible and as we know if somebody sits in a role that's not right for them for six months and then you know yeah. they they leave then you know they have to go find another role and then they've got a short-term job position on their resume and you know i think it's really better both for the business and for the person themselves where there's good open honest frank you know frank conversations and opportunities to change or progress or adapt or perhaps find another seat but yeah i think that that boldness and openness and honesty is can be pretty pivotal for everybody Mm -hmm. And I always sort of think that, you know, just because somebody isn't right for your organization doesn't mean they're not going to be um, really happy somewhere else. Because let's face it, there are many, many different organizations, many, many different cultures, different ways of working. And I think sometimes, you know, I mean, you, obviously, yes, you want to do everything in your power to help a person become the best they can be and, and fit in with where you are. But if it's not working, you're best to let them go because they will be happier finding somewhere else where they fit in better. But also from a company perspective, it just changes the dynamics in the company as well, right? Yeah, and going back to those younger staff, you know, you, they, they're supposed to be going through a whole period of exploration. You know, when I when you look at the population in the US, how you know younger people are staying younger longer. They you know they're getting married later, they're having children later, they're buying houses later. <laughs> yeah. So you know, in theory, that twenties is a great time to explore, and the you know the chances and probability of finding a great company in a great industry, the first one or two jobs are you know naturally naturally quite high. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think. I think where folks can have good conversations about that that's that's key and of course that goes back to those core values being defined and you know banging the drum on on what they are and why they are the way they are as as regularly as possible yeah and hiring firing rewarding and recognizing with those core values cool now i know that you have a family that you've got a couple of daughters and mm -hmm. um i assume a wife over there so you're you're do you do you use eos in your family life um yeah we have a we have a scorecard on our on our fridge so um, I, I have a seven and a ten year old girl so uh, yes. emma and olivia and you know and my wife jamie their, their mum she's a teacher so they're all trundling off to school early and getting home late each day and working hard on the homework so we use the scorecard yeah. in our house to try and get the right balance between the the schoolwork and kind of a healthy body and a healthy body and mind so yeah oh, that's uh, awesome small story uh, the other day the um Asa, our elf on the shelf, actually happened to be reading uh, reading one of the traction books one morning, which I thought was <laughs> was either miraculous and magic or quite witty on the on the uh, on the part of my other half. Ah, uh, that is awesome! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, do you have things on the scorecard too? You and your wife? Um, yeah, I'm pretty um, I'm pretty diligent on my scorecard. Again, being being um, excuse me one second, um, just being very quantitative. I like. That. I like that weekly accountability. So, yep, I have uh, two two scorecards for my my practice and and one for personal things. And I think it's good to keep going and be looking at what's important. And yeah, those weekly kind of check ins for all different areas are so beneficial. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, it's funny because my, my husband has been saying recently, whenever you have some kind of challenge, shall we IDS that? And he hasn't really actually quite embraced the US yet, but he's, he's starting to pick up some of the terminology, which is good. <laughs> They're talking about a scorecard. <laughs> our families live it with us, right? They get to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, it is great. Okay, so um, we've heard a little bit about, you know, sort of your, your story and what you're doing. Um, I'd love to hear from you because we like to give the listeners a couple of, you know, tips or tools they can use in their, in their personal and professional life. Do you have a couple of tips or three tips or tools you could share with us? Yeah, so sure. So I think the, the key one that's always stood me in good stead is having that clear, clear picture. And I think when you're working on a vision with folks, it's important to have that both at a group level, whatever group it is, whether it's a a sports club, a charity, or a business. I think it's important to have mm -hmm. the big overarching vision and then also spend the time working with, with that individual to make sure that you're aware of their vision and you're, you know, you're able to have some kind of, you know, commitment and part in that. So I think setting visions at different, at different levels is really important and making sure that it's exciting, appealing, and that you're on the, on the same page. I think that'd be yeah. my, my first one. I think this, I think the second one after, to kind of repeat it again after our mid twenties, it really just makes sense to concentrate more on our strengths than our than our blind spots. So yeah, be be aware of those blind spots, but really just be be kind of who you are and really hammer home on those 
on those strengths. And I think part of our job is we very often get to let people know, you know, and clarify what their strengths, what their strengths are. So if somebody's unsure, go ask the four or five people in and around you, you know, what, you know, yep. what do you think my strengths are? And you'll get some great, you'll get some great insight. And then mm-hmm. I think the other one in terms of accountability, it's, it really comes down to the people that you, you, you know, you kind of have around you, you know, those that you have your conversations with or that you, you kind of, you know, share discussion on some of those blind spots and those that help hold you accountable to those, you know, to those big audacious goals. So, yep, I think those would be my three, the, the vision, the, you know, knowing your strengths and acting on them and then, mm-hmm. you know, having great people around to, to help keep you accountable. And, and I think also inspire you as well. That's, that's key as well. Yeah, I always say that, you know, I'm, <laughs> I actually, I enjoy exercise, but I'm not very good at going to the gym on my own. And so, um, I have to have somebody who actually holds me accountable. I've got a personal trainer. Three times a week, I have to go in there. I do my weight training. Otherwise, I would find every excuse under the sun not to do it. Um, so I think, yeah, that account, so having people around you who can actually hold you accountable is really important for me. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I think there are certain things that we naturally kind of hold ourselves accountable to. And then there are some areas where we, we need that help. So I think, yeah, I like that idea as well. Good on you. Thank you. Yeah, the business business I've got no problem with whatsoever, but no, whatsoever. But um, yeah, not so much on the health thing. Okay, so Mark, you work with companies. You actually help them to implement EOS. You're there to kind of you know teach them the tools, facilitate the discussions, um, and hold them accountable. What kind of clients do you like to work with, and where are they located? Um, my executive coach actually asked me this question the other day, and I kind of gave a, a, a kind of a feeble, non-specific answer. But I, when I thought about it, it comes down to me for. Any, any leadership team that are on a, you know, they're looking to head in a certain direction and they're open, honest, growth oriented and ready to go take those ne- next steps. I'm always happy to have, to have conversations with those. And it's, it's kind of fun, right? You feel that excitement when you have a great conversation with other, with other leaders. So I think they're my, my criteria. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I try and bring that positivity to things and I'm naturally quite purposeful. So, um, I think the clients that are suited to me are the ones that, want to benefit from somebody who can help them in working out what are three, four, five steps ahead and then what things do we need to take care of to, to kind of get there. Perfect. And is there a particular location? Because I know that you're obviously in Phoenix, Arizona. What are the areas that you, you tend to work in? Or is... Yeah, so typically like... out here in the in the southwest, so I'm happy to travel anywhere in this region. So, you know, Arizona, California, New Mexico, uh, Texas and such, again, depending on the depending on the, the team and the, the opportunity. Um, being a Brit, yep. I've been able to hit 30 odd states in the US. So I'm always always kind of open to traveling somewhere new and new and exciting. I have a couple that are on my list to try and get to in the next couple of years, but primarily in the Southwest. Yeah. Fair enough. But you also can do things virtually as well, right? I and mean, we've, we've all adapted to doing virtual, yeah. particularly when you've got teams that are based around the world. And I have a, a company at the moment, a, a wonderful group of leaders who specialize in uh, virtual events so uh, they're kind of you know perfectly suited oh. to managing that environment but and i just had a a new client uh, i partnered with this week who we're going to have i think folks in three different three different countries for our calls so that'll provide a, a unique challenge and we'll be checking our our world clocks to make sure we all start at the at the right time but yeah i think virtual has just become become Perfect. part of it at this point right absolutely so if people want to get hold of you mark where would they actually um find you Yep. So LinkedIn's always a, a good spot. So I'm um, just searching for Mark Stone Phoenix EOS um, on LinkedIn. I'll do it or by email at, at mark.stone at eosworldwide.com. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, look, Mark, thank you so much for spending time with us this morning. Really appreciate, really appreciate having a chat with you about your experiences. Um, look forward to keeping in contact and hopefully seeing you again soon. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed the enjoyed the chat.